Hello, welcome to Visual Radio. It is Thursday, June 28th, 2012. And let's see, 33 years ago, I played the Paradise Theater in Boston for the very first time. Ought to go back in time. That was a lot of fun. And I played there 49 times. Tonight, we have Roxanne Fontana phoning in from London. And next week, we hope to have Jimmy Church, great guitar player from Nashville, phoning in. Dick Wagner should be phoning in in August. Steve Hunter might be the third week in July. And we have all sorts of guests lined up. I've got to contact Richie Sarno again up in Burlington because we have the Alan Wilson biographer. So lots of stuff on the plate. And we're waiting for Roxanne Fontana to phone in from merry old London town. I have my delicious water here. Welcome Winchester. It's a beautiful day in Winchester. What a gorgeous town. Walking around out there. Um, that waterfall right in the center of the town. I absolutely adore it. You must pardon me. I've got to have a drink. H2O, H2O, that's what I drink. Anyway, I've been doing some editing. In the computer, we have Barbara Harris of The Toys, Margaret Ross of The Cookies. Remember Chains? The Beatles did the song Chains. We have Margaret Ross and Barbara Harris, a uh, 60 super group doing Chains. But uh, today, June 28th, Oldies 103, 103.3 FM, which dropped the Oldies title. They shouldn't have done that, but they dropped the Oldies thing and well they they changed their format they're no longer doing pop from the 60s 70s and 80s that's what we'll call it popular music and paula street i hear ended with fun 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 and uh this is our guest hello roxanne yes did you get through Oh, no, 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 this is the wrong number. 781. I emailed you the number. I emailed you the number. You're, you're on my cell phone. You're not on the air. Uh, 781. 721. 0137. Very good. I knew that. It happens all the time. People call the cell phone. Because visual radio is like talking to me in my living room. I've got to have some water. So we're going to have a fun talk to Roxanne Fontana from London. And we'll talk about Boston radio later. Maybe next week. First time in four weeks, Gene Martin's not sitting here. Hello, London. Hey there. How you doing? Good, Roxanne. How are you? I'm actually not in London. I'm in the Midlands, which is two hours north of London. The Midlands. Yeah, you know, the black country, as it's called. Wow. I mean, that's exciting. For yeah. me, it's exciting. Starting today, we had tremendous um, hell balls, like golf balls, falling. It was a pretty wild scene. And it, like, flooded immediately. But then it cleared immediately, so that's okay. So, Roxanne, do you think there's a global warming thing actually happening? Uh, yeah. I don't think that's all of it, you know, I think some of it's, um, I don't know, you know, there's all kinds of theories out there, but it's, it's, uh, geoengineering and all this stuff, you know, have you heard about that? No. Oh, it's, it's like, uh, experiments with, uh, the air pressures and trying to make the sun hit back into space to prevent global warming, and there's all these things going on supposedly, and that's what's making things weird also. Geoengineering. I don't know what I believe, you know, who knows. I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know if they have the capability yet, but it's a it's a lofty thought. Yeah, I don't know either. But it is it was strange today, how. I don't know. You know, really big hell balls. You know, it all goes back to Frankenstein and the Pandora's box. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's right. No political conversations. <laughs> no, but I will say this. I can't review the new Spider Man movie. But I felt very much uh, it delves into that whole Frankenstein theme. So I'll, I'll let our audience just ponder that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But that's why people make music. Like you make music, I make music. We make music to get away from. Exactly, to escape the, uh, the, the, you know, the horrible realities. So before I start asking you questions about your book and your music and all your lovely videos on the YouTube. Oh, thank you. I got this new Donovan double disc from uh, Sony, Epic Legacy, Sony. You know Donovan, Hurdy Gurdy Man. And of course. Yeah. He's from London, of course, and uh, he got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Just hearing all of his songs in a two-disc set is just amazing. Uh, not all his songs, all his, like, better-known compositions. Again, it's mind-blowing how creative that guy was at such a young age. Yeah, yeah, he's great, you know. He's great. And let's say, it's, it's how long? It's two CDs? Yeah, it's two CDs. It's the best. And so, do they have anything of him with uh, the French singer Zuzu? Because um, he's done stuff with Zuzu. Do you know who she is? No. Uh, she was a singer in the uh, in the sixties, a French pop singer, and she's fabulous. And she did some Donovan covers, and I think they did something recently. I wonder if that's on there. I don't think so. Uh because I don't recall it, and they didn't, and Anthony DeCurtis, one of my guests, he's on Facebook, he, um, he wrote the liner notes, but there was nothing conclusive if it's Led Zeppelin playing on Hurdy Gurdy Man. Oh, no, I heard that it wasn't, actually. I, I don't think it's uh, Jimmy Page, even though it really sounds like him. I, don't, I heard that it wasn't. It's only John Paul Jones? I think he might be on there, from what I heard. I met John years ago, you know. That's really? That's my book, too. I think everything's in my book. Uh, oh. Well, let's start with your records. That's how I met you. Um, right. When you worked with Dino Donnelly, that was certainly not your first record, right? No, it was. It wasn't my first, you know, every time I ever recorded. No, because I've been recording for years, you know. It, just, it was the first time that it was actually going to be a full album. And not just a song here or there, a song to show someone, or three songs, or whatever, you know. It was the first time it was set out to be a full album. And it really didn't even start like that. I was going to do an EP with um, sort of like recordings I'd done, and I wanted to do a version of my song Spring and Love because I could never get a good version of it whenever I recorded it on my own. And I wanted it to sort of sound like blues, pop rock, like the Rascals. And so I tracked Zeno down, and then he said, we're going to do a whole album, and we're not going to do anything like what you think it's going to be like. We're going to do it. This way, and I, you know, and I was really not into it, but I love the end product. You know, I think it's, he did a great job with it. But it was all about that song, Spring and Love, and um, but what was Blue is the one that you know sells that everybody loves and buys, and it's like a cult or something. The Love is a true cult, and uh, yeah, it's cool. But um, yeah, that was the first album. You know, Roxanne, do you think um, an instrumental song could be a hit in 2012? Sure. You know, because Love is Blue had such majesty and theme from a summer's oh, place beautiful. and theme from the good, the bad, and the ugly. That it, it, um, it was knocked off, no, it knocked uh, the, the Young Rascals song off the number one spot with Love is Blue. So that was a trip also for like me and Gino to be doing this thing together, you know, to be doing a cover of a song that knocked off, I think it was It's a Beautiful Morning, knocked it off the number one spot. Isn't that strange? It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful morning. And I love so many versions of Love is Blue. And I wanted to do it. It was my idea to do the song, not to, you know, but he, you know, he took it over. I mean, he really, the album is really more, it is, than mine. It's my songs, so I'd go down there with the acoustic guitar and play it like a folk song, all that stuff. And then he would completely do a, do a background track, you know, of all the instruments, him and his partner, down there without me. And then they'd call me up and say, okay, come in and sing your song to this. So strange, you know. I mean, I've never heard of that ever being done like that. And because uh, it, it was still more melodies, and they built up these things that I had no approval of or didn't know what they were going to do. And you know, even they'd have to show me where the intro was supposed to be. And I think it came out great. I mean, I really love it all. You know, it's a real but leap of faith to jump into someone's studio and let them take control of your music. Yeah, well, he was so enthusiastic about it. I mean, he was still working on Spring and Love when I had the, the whole record finished, ready, and done. He was still, he was like on this obsessive trip with doing another mix of the song. And that's so flattering because he's such a great, you know, drummer and a, and a legend, you know, in rock and roll. So to, to love my song that much, to keep 
wanting to cook it up in many different ways. But anyway, you know, what ended up there was when I put my foot down and said, okay, it's done. You know, because some people can never be done with something. This is... Oh yeah. Uh, you know, oh yeah. It's, it's not it's not a new little behavior in the music field where people will just work a thing to death. And I just said that's it. It's over. This is it. We have I think we actually have two versions of it on the record, right? And that you know it was time to stop. I think well, he was still doing it after I was gone. You know, like out of the situation with the studio, he was still remixing. Well, you know what I do, Roxanne, is I take away like ten, twelve, fifteen mixes. And I'll let the engineer have a little input, and I'll call it, you know, so-and-so's mix. And I might let a musician have some input. But, and I don't have an ego problem with if the bass player came up with a great idea and it's in the mix. We use that bassist mix, you know? Because you're, you're uh, you want to be the seagull over the water two weeks later. Uh, and when you're swimming in the water, when you're the bird swimming in the water, it's hard to have a perspective. And I need time to think about it and listen. That's me anyway. Right. Well, the second record I did was totally unlike the first one, you know. I mean, I, was, I, I did it pretty much with Gordon Raphael, and he played the keyboards, and he recorded the whole thing. And he, it was just like me and him, and me telling him, this is what I want to do with this song, and can you make this kind of sound? And, and I even, certain parts I even actually wrote for him to do, you know. But now, who is, who is Gordon Raphael? Oh, Gordon's great. Gordon's from Seattle, and he was with a, a few popular Seattle bands, and then he produced the Hit Strokes album, right? And I think he also discovered Regina Spector. He's really cool. He's so talented. And um, so he did all these things for me, you know, and he was really um, encouraging and everything during the second album. And I prefer the second album to the first album. And what year was that about? Hmm? What year was that about? Oh, it's uh, 2000, 2001, 2000 or 2001. Oh, wow. When did we meet each other? Around 1999? Yeah, when Love is Blue came out, you reviewed it, and that's how, you know, we got to know each other. And the uh, thing is that, you know, I, I did those records, and I sort of um, got out of pushing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't really push them, because I immediately, after that, got married, and my husband's great writer, and I was sort of like helping him with his career, and also co-writing songs with him. And I moved to L.A. from New York, so the HR label was no more. And I moved to L.A., and then I got pregnant and had a baby, and, and you know, and, and whatever, you know, I just didn't really have uh, the, the, the money to promote the, the records. And then years later, about five years ago, I just started going through my old videos, and I took them out, and, and I said, well, maybe something here is good for YouTube, you know. And I was surprised, because I thought at least, you know, a handful of them were. So I took them out, and then all of a sudden, all this blue started selling out of nowhere. And it sells more every year since it's been out, since the year before. Do you know what I'm saying? You mean on iTunes and, and stuff? I'm still, I'm still putting it out there, because people obviously want it, you know. Wow. You know, I'm with people to get it, right? People want it, and, and it's like every year, it's more and more. And, you know, I check my... My sales, and it's, it's always Love is Blue, and then slowly the second album is starting to come in, which is really strange, but whatever, you know, I'm just, I'm just following what's happening. So, that's no. cool. And then what happened last year was, you know, we thought, well, let's go to the south of France and try to do some scope scope tone style videos. You know, it's from the old days, they're like really low, super low, no budget, never mind low budget, no budget, you know sort of things and just try to capture something and just be into the song, right? Yep. So we did them and I thought, like, we did like four and I said, well, if one of them is good enough, then we'll have succeeded. And then I came back and I watched them and I really, I loved all four, you know, not to sound vain, but I did. And so we put them out there and people love them. So it's like, great. And then we did Green, which was to recording I did a long time ago that I had remastered and did something to that. And that's really popular too, you know. So it's, it's, um, not a conventional way that I've been doing things, but it seems to be floating along somehow, you know. And in the book, of course, you know, I wrote the book so I could get people interested in the music, but now it's like the book is, you know. So what's like, the title of the book? Maybe, you know, I don't know. What's the book title? American Girl. American Girl. Um, I want to go back to The Color of Imaging Whim. Mm -hmm. I like that video. I put it on my Facebook tonight. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's a great song. I wrote that so long. It's such a great song. It's like a real 
quintessential 60s influence pop song. Now, where was the video cut? Angry Lives, you know? Hmm? Yeah, where was the video done? Oh, and that's just pictures. It's just pictures. Um, oh, okay. I liked it a lot. I liked... No, yeah, that was just pictures from, I think, the 80s. Because, yeah, I did an EP. I remastered stuff I did in Holland. They recorded in Holland about four or five songs. And went back to New York and... Uh, I had some labels interested by Capitol Records in LA and they had meetings with me, but they didn't want to fly the band into New York City to see them and the guys in Holland were sort of like, you know, we're not going to spend money and go to New York. Right. You know, they just didn't want to do that. And uh, so Tony Bon Jovi actually bought all of those masters because he loved it, you know, and he'd come, come to see me play and he said, oh, you're great. So he bought all my masters because they were left in Holland, I couldn't afford them. And he bought them, and he had them sent to New York City, and we were going to do something together, but then he retired. You know, <laughs> like, all these stories are in the book, and all these, these funny, crazy things. But I had this thing thanks to him. I had the original, so I had it remastered, and I just put it out last year, you know, sort of best of the 80s, best of my 80s, anyway, right? I was hanging out with Tony back in 95. Where is he? I haven't, I haven't heard his name in, like, 17 years. Yeah, yeah, he, um... He had that great studio. Uh, he's the best. But he would tell me stories that he was in the studio when the Supremes were recording Love Child. Like, that's how he got his start, was just being around there. And uh, that, that really, that thrilled me, you know. And I was so honored he liked me because someone from that kind of a uh, background, you know. I was working with a band, Blacklight Rainbow, out of Philadelphia. And they had rented his power station, was it? Was that him? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had the downstairs of the power station. And... These guys were doing really great work, and they kept erasing it. And I said, what are you erasing it for? Oh, we're only practicing. And, and Roxanne, they didn't get it. The practicing was actually better than the finished product. They were erasing these incredibly great takes. But it was downstairs. They were renting from Tony, and I was upstairs, and there was ACDC just hanging out because they were making their record there. That's the way it was at Tony's place, you know? Yeah, I think I was there. I think... Um Eric Clapton was making a record there, and uh, George Harrison was there, and all that. And, and when I had to go and study for my tapes, it was, uh, it was a good studio. I don't even think it's still around, is it? No. Now they're all closed down. It's a terrible time. Uh, people are recording at home, and the, the sound quality. Well, I really like. I really like that song. Was that from the eighties uh, that I just mentioned? Imagine Wim. Imagine Wim. Yeah, I recorded it in Holland in the mid '80s. Yeah, that was the Holland track. That it's really no wonder Tony liked it. I liked it a lot. Yeah, that band was incredible. The band I had in Ireland, they were just really amazing, fun, and well, you know, the you high school soul that we that really rocked out. You you mentioned it in Zuzu. There's so many great singers that Americans never really heard about because in in other countries never heard our art really uh, unless they were connoisseurs and bought records from overseas. Before YouTube, before, yeah. mm -hmm. before eBay, so it was a lot harder for people to um, understand all these great scenes happening all around the world, which now, of course, we're very tuned into. Yeah, well, it's, you know, everything's so different now. It's, you know, it's better in a way. I mean, you can tap into things and everything seems like it's fresh again because I think the era of the music of the 60s and the 70s and the 50s probably in that order. But then even 20s music, everything just seems like classical music is, you know, where yes. it doesn't matter. It's, it's, you know, in the 90s they called it retro, but you know, people don't call it retro anymore, you know, we, we, we should get rid of all these stupid labels retro. You just listen to what you want to listen to and what you vibrate to. You know, if it's Jimi Hendrix, it could be then, it could be now, it could be any time, right? Right. If the music, the music lives on, you know, he's gone, but, but you know, what mattered about him was, was what he did, you know, the music. And that you can tap into that now, just the way people are allowed to listen to, you know, Beethoven, you know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I do like labels. I like um, space age bachelor pad music. And I like Northern Soul. Are you into Northern Soul? Yeah, yeah. Because they're up there in the Midlands, right? Yeah, well, you know, North is here. But, you know, I just, I have a problem with, like, modern British pop music because... I think what made it, you know, we put it on the map, we're sort of imitating black American music, and we sort of lost their way, you know, and 
in a court made in Seoul, but it isn't really like black American music. And the best British music was, was you know, the birds imitating the black Americans. It's just that the mixture is, is what is, is so special. That's why it became so, you know, famous. Hey, you know, Ray Davis, Ray Davis is known for that you really got me with. You know, it's just like, you know, when, uh, when Steve Marriott was still alive, and they asked him about what he thought about, I think, uh, Paul Weller and the jam, and, and he said that they looked great, but it, really, it didn't have anything to do with the kind of music he was doing. And, it, and it's like a real punch in the stomach in a way, but it's, it's true, you know, because that's the thing, you know, the, the best British music is interpreting black music. Maybe the best white music is interpreting black music, no matter where you're from, you know. Well, that's my point about, you know, Ray Davies had that you really got me with, right? Yeah. But you know, he got it by fooling around with Richard Berry's Louie Louie. Mm hmm So, we, we all think of this great Ray Davies stroke of genius, but he was just messing around with the guitar, playing Louie Louie, and made it a little bit more, changed the tempo, and made it a little harder. And you got you really got me, and all day and all of the night, and all those great. And those things become monsters on their own. They're their own monsters, you know. Well, they seem like that they are the pioneers when they're actually a reflection of the black music of America. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's great. It's great how it mutates. It's not even now anymore. Like no, I don't know if anyone was anything like that, which is crazy because it was like that for so long. But I mean, I love good pop music too. I mean, I love the Duran Duran. They're not really like American black music, you know. But they record their records right here, you know. Right up the street here. They, oh, they, 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 do, they uh, work uh, with a guest of mine um, from the band Astra. So Anthony Rusta, and he, he's recording a lot of the Duran Duran stuff. He's been working with them for years. Oh, really? So they come from England to hang out in well, Rusta. That's from like, where I live now, like the Midlands, I think. Mention, if you see them, mention Anthony Rusta, and they'll laugh, because hey, he's their bud, you know? You'll see his name on their records. Oh, yeah? Yeah, but the, uh, here's a lovely loft in, uh, in the mill factories. In the old mill factories, it's a gorgeous studio, and he's a good guy. But, you know, it's funny that Duran Duran comes here now to make records. Or they ship the files here, you know? Right. You can ship files anywhere. That's true. That's, you know, the glory of the age of Aquarius. And Dropbox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, when did, did you write the book in, like, uh, you just decided... I wrote the book in one year around the same time that I recorded Love is Blue. And did you have notes with you, or you just... I've been keeping journals since 1975, so it's not all my memories. <laughs> Uh, and, and also, I'm used to writing because I've always done that, you know. I mean, I can sit down for hours at a stretch and write. That's just like glorious. Just, just write. Just write about whatever, you know, anything. Yeah. And uh, anything and everything. So I was sort of used to doing that kind of thing. Anyway, it wasn't just like, well, I'm a musician and I've had this, this interesting life. So I'm going to write a book. I've been writing the whole time. And then that year, though, I said, okay, I'm going to write this book. And I really, you know, it really wasn't completely into it to, you know, this sort of like putting my whole personal life out there like that, you know? Because I'm not, I'm not really like that. And uh, I spent the whole year pretty much full time, like every day, because that's what you have to do, you know? I mean, what is it, like 360 pages long or something? So I really had to put my mind to it. So I was doing it every day for about a year, around the time when I was doing the record, but when I was doing the record, as I told you, I just went in, put the tracks down, came back and did vocals, what was you know, <laughs> you know, and so I had time to write this book until it ends in '99, which was which is really interesting. And I didn't know it at the time, even though I intentionally ended it there. But what's interesting is, you know, at the end of the book, it's like I meet with Prince Charming, and then my whole life completely changes anyway. So that's why it felt safe safe to put the book out because the life I have now and since is nothing like. Life in the book, you know. Okay. So, like, the book is basically a girl alone, you know, with boyfriends, trying to make it in the music business, and, and everything in between day jobs, friends, the whole thing, right? And all these experiences. And my life is nothing like that anymore. It's not just because I live in England, you know, a different country. It's not really like that. Now, is your husband from England? No, no. He's, he's not from here, but his mother's British. Oh. So, so, you know, he was able to come over here, and I'm, I have a Italian passport, so I was able to come over here legally. So, yeah, so, 
you know, it was, it was easy. It wasn't like, you know, typical Americans going over to England to live. Now, I reviewed his record at the same time, didn't I? Yeah, he had a, a, an EP that was available, but those, those are really just, you know, demos of this record that he's supposed to make soon, we hope. Oh. With, um, with Jack Douglas producing, which is going to be, like, to me, the record that's going to save rock and roll, because the songs are great, you know, he's a good singer, he looks good. He's young, my husband, he's 20 years younger than me, so he's got... 20 years of suffering to do, <laughs> so, you know, so that's cool. But yeah, I, I hope that, that you know, it all works out because the songs are really good, so we're just working on that here in England. Oh, that's marvelous. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting, you know. So, yeah, even Bill Warner is going to play on one of the tracks on the ballad, you know. I wanted him to do because I just felt like the song was like that, and uh yeah, just people and they wanted to hear the song, which was great, because I knew that he would be that way, because I've met Bill a few times, and he hates new music, he thinks everybody sucks, you know? <laughs> so, but I, I felt confident enough in the song to, to show that to him and have the audacity to ask him, you want to play bass on this? And he came back immediately and said, yes, because the song is great, it's a ballad, and uh, I just hear it, you know, if you know music, you can hear it, this is a great song. So it's cool, so you know, we really want to do his record. I'm just a co-writer. I'm not going to play anything on it or even sing on it. But I just, I co-wrote about half the songs for that. So Who's going to be singing? I was doing it and all of a sudden my thing starts to happen. I did these videos and I put the lights on the show because this thing with me was really unplanned, you know. I mean, people that sort of came on board and discovered me were saying to me, you have that book, so put it out. Don't keep plugging it to a publisher or something. Just put it out. This is the end of the age. Get it out as an e-book and put it out. And they really inspired me, certain people that, that are into my stuff, you know. And so I did it that way. And it's getting good reviews, you know, people like it. I hope you like it. Did you read a bit of it? Or? I've been so busy, I'm honest with people. I get so many books, I just don't have the time, Roxanne. I, 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 it's I, amazing I have the time to edit and do this show. You know, but I make, I, I just carve a little time out every week and do the show. Mm -hmm. And. You know, and, and you tell your story, and people tell their story, and um, I, I would love to read books. I have no time to read books. <laughs> a little on the treadmill sometimes, but see, you sent me an e-book, so that's even harder. If people send me a hard copy, then I, I force myself to read a chapter, you know? Oh, I'm totally, yeah, I'm with you on that. I hope it comes into print. I, I think it's going to come into print, like, within the next six months. Yeah. I think I explained it to you. I explained it to everyone. If you send me an e-book, you know, it's very tough for me to get to it. But so on the other hand, you could just sort of go to find and look for something you may want to read. And then if it's good enough, you get, like, drawn into it and want to read more. Well, there's, what, six billion people on the planet, and half of them are on the Internet. So uh, the marketplace is huge. It's monstrous. Well, it could be a good time. You know, it could be a good time for the economy. But, but things are strange out there, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's a strange time for everything. Yeah, I liked what you opened the show with. You were telling me about this geo... What is it called? Geo... Oh, geoengineering? Geoengineering. It's <laughs> so weird. Yeah. Um, you know, I have this theory that it's just like mankind's been committing suicide since the Industrial Revolution. And if all this is happening with this geoengineering and, and all of that, then, you know, there's really thought of a DVD this time. This may really do us all in, you know, because we need our sun and we need our natural weather. And, you know... But whatever, you just have to try to have a good time every day and make people aware and maybe, maybe we can change things. Maybe they're not meant to be changed, you know, maybe... Oh, they are meant to be changed. You've heard about the tipping point. Do you know what the tipping point is? The tipping point? Yeah, I know that I got from Ted Cobble on that one, right? Well, in science fiction, uh, a race of people, the human race, reaches a tipping point where they either graduate from the College of Life and get to the enlightened next level, or they cease to exist and they got replaced by another matrix, you know? We've done it. You know, we've been doing it for thousands of years, right? But the thing is now, with the technology, you know, if, if there's a, you know, radiation explosion from Japan, we're all gone. So there's no time to say, oh, let's do something else. Because if the technology is there, that man can really commit mass suicide, you know? And that's, that's very scary. Well, think about all the radiation, the radiated 
products that are floating across the Pacific Ocean into California and Alaska. What's it doing to the fish? All from the tsunami. And what's it doing to our environment? There's going to be radioactivity on that stuff. Right, and all that means is that you die of cancer, okay? I, I read something that, you know, people are in British Columbia, like the cancer rate, it was up 40,000 since the earthquake. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, there you go. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. It's just a matter of time. So you have, so it's not going to happen like all at once, like a dream day, so it could happen over, you know, everybody's gone within a year or two, or three or four or five. And that's terrible, you know? It's so terrible. But what can you do? You know, this is, this, 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 this is technology and crazy mankind, you know. Well, you know if we're in the path... So that's why we have music, right? So, right. Um, you know if we're in the path of um, the gamma rays from a nova, do you know what happens? It obliterates everything in its path, so in an instant, you won't even know what's coming. It just goes right through and everything's obliterated instantly. Right, you get sucked into the vortex or something. Well, it's, it's the best way to go because you don't even see it coming. It's just a, flip, a flick of a light switch. Uh, yeah. that's, that's a lot more pleasant than an asteroid hitting the planet, you know? Yeah, last year I was convinced we were going to have some sort of, uh, what was it? I don't remember. Some asteroid. I was really convinced this was going to happen. I was actually out there, but I think the sun blew it up or something before I came to the end. Well, just, we're, we're so barbaric, and even the enlightened ones of us that are less barbaric, you've got people um, in older cultures killing magnificent turtles, and they put it up on YouTube, and it's horrifying to me, desecrating life and these ancient species that are dying off, and people, they're just too illiterate to know better. They're unenlightened. No, well, you know, you can say that, but, you know, there was a big um, boom on about, I think it was the king of Spain or something, taking trophy pictures with kids, um, rare animals in Africa. I mean, it was so, so, you know, that's not necessarily, that's a guy that spends a lot of money to kill, a, a, you know, it's nuts. It's just nuts. Not only him, a couple of sons of one of the uh, uh, candidates for office. I'm not going to say which one, I have a good idea which, but um, a couple of sons were doing the same thing. These rare species, they go and they hunt them. Yeah, this is like, you know, I don't know. Oh, and go shoot an elephant, which are very familial, and... and That's and, what we're going to see, it just, it just gets me really angry, but, you know, what can you do about people like... You can write a second book. I'm serious, you can write a second book. Outrage. I mean, that's why we... Uh, no, I can't get into that, because I, it's just too, um... It's too... I don't know. And start really like John the Baptist, you know. I mean, what for? People, you know, everybody has to save themselves, right? Hey, Roxanne, what's your website again? Eva Fontana, 1959.com. V I V A. Fontana. F O N T A N A. Right, 1959. 1959.com. And I'll say it again uh, later in the show. Viva Fontana, 1959. So you like 1959. Of course, Five years after me? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. It was a good year. It was a good time to grow up, you know. That's hey. the thing, you know, the, you know, the 60s, that year, whatever, the golden age of, of modern pop culture is probably the way to go down in history. To be a real child, because the people that were the movers and the shakers, they were the kids of the 60s, you know. But my generation, we were the kids of the 60s. You know, um, it's, it's a whole thing, you know. Oh, well, you and I are in the same generation. Um, yeah. And, and it was a marvelous time. Marvelous, marvelous time. Especially to be living in the city. You know, I don't know where you live, but I lived in Brooklyn, and it was really alive, and everything was coming through. And I'm so lucky that I was in that environment during, during that era. Just when I was lucky to be going into the city during the punk rock era, you know. And I'm so glad I did all that. Did you meet Robert Franco's uh, in Brooklyn? He lived there. The writer. No. Has he ever, has he ever reviewed your records? No, I don't know him. Oh, he lives in Canada. I'm going to hook you up with Robert Franco's because you both lived in Brooklyn at the same time. Yeah, it was. He's a cool guy. It was, it was a good time. You know, Patty Paladin, She's from just like a few blocks away 
from where I was from. She's from like Avenue O, and wow. I was on Avenue M, you know. Wow. And and that was during the sixties. And then years later, of course, in the late seventies, I used to go to Max's and she used to sit in and um, you know, do stuff with Johnny Thunders. And I saw all of that. And then I just, you know, so I always knew who she was, and you know, I just met her in the past, whatever, five, ten years. And she told me that's where she's from, Avenue you know. And it sort of blew my mind, because it's from that era. It was it, a really great time then. It really was. So Johnny Thunders yeah. was fun. Yeah. And we're losing so many people now, too. It's, it's just amazing. You know, yeah. Baby Gray and uh, Donna Summer and Robin Gibb, and a lot of these icons are falling. Yeah, it's very sad. But like I said before, the music, the music's always there, you know? The, the music is always there? Yeah. So, are you going to tour at all? I don't know, you know? I don't, I don't really know. I, I think I'm going to do a video for um, the Michael in the Garden. I think I'm going to do that around here, you know, in England, because it's, it's just perfect for that. It's the Ralph McTell cover that I did on the second record. Mm -hmm. I think I might do that, and then after that, I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to get people to read my book and maybe do another record. I mean, I'd like to do another electronic record, you know, to be honest. Because, you know, the way I did Love is Blue. I wouldn't even work with Dino again, I mean, I would do that. Or, or somebody else would do that kind of, um, do that kind of sound. Because it's, it's really interesting. Now, is Dino you know, still in touch with you? No, we haven't spoke for a while, you know, we, we spoke, I think maybe, uh, seven years ago because uh, Ralph Warren is going to use Love is Blue, their, their advertising agency, really like the, you know, in the running to have Love is Blue as the perfume ad for Ralph Warren. And Tina was like so, like, thrilled, he was freaked out, he was like, you know, having sleepless nights with the excitement of it. But then we went back to the Elton John song. So that was the last time I was in contact with him, was talking about all, all that was almost going to happen. What Elton John's, what sad song say so much, or what was I don't know what, what song they actually used. I, I think I watched it once and I just forgot about it. But, they, you know, but they had put out, they put our Love is Blue to their commercial and I heard that it looked fantastic. I didn't see it, but the, the people at the ad company said it was great. But, you know, they thought that they were going to go for it. But they ended up going with Elton John. So, that's okay. <laughs> Um, you're That's YouTube. Like you folks do you know, it's been a long time. You probably wouldn't want to work with me again. I said you're crazy. But that's where I am. You know, I drive people crazy in the studio because I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I'm very impatient. You know, I'm also designing clothes. And when I design clothes, I don't have the impatience I have with music. Maybe because I love music more. But I'm, I'm just like completely, you know, like, I don't know. I, I'm just whatever. But with, with the clothes I've been designing and, and putting together, I'm really patient with every single thing. And I, I wish I was like that with music. I'd enjoy the, the recording process more. But in saying that, I, I would like to do another record, you know, electronic record, another record of, of, you know, other stuff. Bachman and Turner from Bachman Turner Overdrive are going to do a covers album. They feel that no one will buy their music today, the style of music they write, so they want to do a covers album. Now that should be interesting. Bachman Turner Overdrive doing covers. Yeah, you know, I sometimes when I get in a really funny mood, I make my husband play taking care of business against his will. It just sounds so very live, you know, he just like rocks it on the guitar. Sometimes you just have to hear it. But I don't know what kind of, what if, what if they just, See what they do. They have hits on their own. They don't have to do covers. Well, everyone wants to stay relevant somewhat. And, um, you know, with the band, a retro, uh, again, that word retro, right? They were, um, they were big in the 70s. And um, I reviewed many of their records for AMG, where we met. Uh, it's been a really strange time. I was at um, Wolverhampton Hall the other night, and I watched Patti Smith, and... Um, it was like a, a flyer around with all these acts that were playing there. And it's hilarious because they were like a, it was like a mixture of every single year's popular band of the era. So, you know, the times we live in now are really strange, you know, because, like, everybody's out there, everybody's doing everything. Well, people get married, people have like kids. There's a lot of acts that I wouldn't even want to go and see, you know. But you, you can't drag me out to clubs anymore. 
people try to invite me to clubs, it's very hard for me to go out. Uh, I did that. I've been to thousands of shows, you know? Yeah. And the Beach Boys were there last yeah, night. Yeah, I missed them. Yeah, you know, but usually, you know, unfortunately, there's so many bands out. I mean, that's the first reason there's so many bands out, but unfortunately, I rarely walk in on one that's, you know, worth anything, to be honest. Um, individuality seems to have faded. A lot of the kids today are technically proficient, but they're not characters, like, you know, Roxanne Fontaine is a character. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, and, and the, I can I can put a handle on what uh, you're doing in my head. Uh, huh? There's got to be characters somewhere. I, I, just, where are they, you know? Well, you know, there, there are, but the, a lot of the new bands, a lot of the 20-something kids, they're, um, they're not as adventurous. They're more technically proficient. They all can play in tune. They all sound good. They can bring programs with them. It's a computer age. But I don't know about personality. I can't find personality anymore. You know, we're personalities. We're from that era of personalities. Well, you know, in the old days, they used to have record companies that, that were able to, to find that for us. But I guess those don't exist anymore. No, because they make more money uh, making games. They don't make any money. How do you think they make money? They don't, they're like, you know... Oh, the record company's making a fortune with downloads and with all the product they own. And there's only three or four of them anyway. I don't know, do they, do they really, you know, is it really as successful as it was in its heyday? I really doubt it. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, they're, they're making money hand over a fist, don't let anyone kid you. Well, it's not really true because to get a number one record today, you have to think the kind of amount of records that you have to sell to be number one today would have probably got you to number 23 in 1974. It, it's just, the, the records aren't selling anymore. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... Um, the catalogs are so thick and lucrative that money's pouring oh, yeah. into the labels. They don't have to do any work. Yeah, I see what you mean. So everything's on back catalog. Oh, yeah, and they're not even taking care of important art. I mean, see if you can find uh, Gerald Wilson's, um, you better believe it, this magnificent jazz album, which you can get on a specialty label, but the thing should be in every store in America. But then again, there are no stores, are there? There's no stores. They took them away. So, uh, Gerald Wilson, you better believe it. Go out and listen to it. Yeah, not a good thing. But you see, a show like this, I can say to people, Gerald Wilson, you better believe it. Because my friend Bobby Hebb wrote the song Sonny. He immersed himself in Gerald Wilson. So I got the record, and it's it's an amazing record. It's amazing. But you get turned on to a record by a friend, you know? I that is, so you're turning me on to it. Right, and Bobby Head turned me on to it, so the fellow who wrote Sonny turned me on to it. It was really what he saturated himself in back then, and I gave it an amazing review on AMG. It's just a great record. Um, real genius stuff that was happening, and no one's appreciating this important art. Art. It's art. It's a painting in a museum or an art gallery. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. I right. appreciate it, right? I mean, just the way you've just discovered it, other people have just discovered it. I don't know, we, just, we, we live in times that are, that are changing now, the way the media, the way, the way we're introduced to things even, you know? Well, I've got a couple of minutes left before I talk to my movie guy, so I'm going to ask you your YouTube page. What is that? Uh, just go into Google and, and Google Roxanne Fontana. So I just go to YouTube and do Roxanne Fontana, and yeah, there's a lot on there. There's stuff from the mid '90s. Yeah, That's an amazing. It's, it's all out there on YouTube, people. You can hear Roxanne Fontana. You can hear her. She's beautiful. You can see her. And the funny thing is, you know, I, I take a lot of my shows back then, and people didn't really do that that often, like in the '90s. No. Early 90s. And I did it. I don't even know why I did it. And I would do it, and then I'd go home, and I'd watch it. And it was terrible. I just turned away and never look at it again until 2000 and whatever, three. And, and then I said, you know, it's not that bad. And then I, and people watch it. Oh, this is great. Even though it's all really, you know, there's no budgets involved. But I tell you, you know, honestly, I hate high-budget, typical hit. Right. Hit videos. They, they make me sick. I mean, they really look like, like car commercials or something. I, that's why, you know, I love the old uh, Scopitone videos, and um, when we, we did this stuff last year, it's like, you know, maybe people won't like this, but if I like it, that's what matters, because I'm doing it, you know, and, and if I have any, you know, sort of 
inkling about the public, and maybe people will like it. And so, you know, they do. So this is a, it's a great surprise. That's why I don't really know how to answer what we're going to do next, because what's happening now and what's happening for the past year, I didn't plan that. You know, it just sort of happened. I didn't expect the, the, these two albums that I did all these years ago to start selling, you know, where I could say, hey, maybe I should push it further and do a video. You know, I just went to think those things anyway. I just do it now. And it's like, you know, Oh, that's it. Okay, cool. So I don't even know what's next. It could be nothing. It could be, you know, I mean, it could be everything. So, but it's cool. It's cool. And I'm so, you know, I'm so glad you, you know, I'm talking to you and you're putting it out there. It's, it's good. Thank, thanks for being with us tonight. I have to get to the okay. Women in Green, the movie. But your website is vivafontana1959.com. Roxanne, thank you oh, so yeah. much. All my, all my things are available to us. Oh, cool. Well, I, um, Roxanne, we'll talk later. Okay. I cut you off on purpose. There's a reason, and I'll tell you later. Oh, I know. I remember it now. Okay, good. Viva Fontana, 1959.com, and Google her, and you can get the, the you see all the free videos up on YouTube. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Roxanne. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Roxanne Fontana.